Hello and welcome to the G0 World Podcast. I'm Ian Bremmer, and this is usually where you'll find extended versions of my interviews on public television. But today, I am bringing you a digital special to conversation I recently had with Ruben Vardanyan. He's a Russian-Armenian billionaire and philanthropist who was recently appointed state minister by the self-proclaimed government of Artsakh. You got all that? I doubt it. So let's step back for a minute. When the Soviet Union collapsed back in 1991, former Soviet satellite states, Armenia and Azerbaijan, they were two of the 15 former Soviet Socialist Republics, they went to war with each other over the rugged highlands of Nagorno-Karabakh, or so-called mountainous Karabakh. The area was an Armenian enclave, but it was part of the Azerbaijan Soviet Republic and the national awakenings of the Gorbachev era, the so-called nationalities revolution started in 1988, sparked the movement in the region to leave Azerbaijan and join Armenia. The war ended in 1994 with a fragile truce, leaving Nagorno-Karabakh as a de facto protectorate of Armenia that was only recognized by Armenians. Periodic clashes have persisted since then, during which time Azerbaijan invested its growing oil wealth into a modern military. Recently, the long simmering conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh has once again heated up with Armenia accusing Azerbaijan of blocking the only road that connects the disputed region with Armenia. The Azeris, of course, deny this. They blame Russian peacekeepers. Full disclosure, I'm Armenian on my mother's side, and I've known Ruben Vardanyan for years. And there are extremely heated opinions on both sides of this issue. I fully acknowledge that. But what's clear is that the longer the area remains cut off from Armenian supplies, the higher the risk of a humanitarian crisis in a land that has been embroiled in unresolved conflict for decades. And I hope that my conversation with Ruben will give you a sense of what life is like on the ground in an increasingly stable and very underreported part of the world. Here's our conversation. The G Zero World podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. As the world industrialized, nature suffered. Conservation has been dominated by Western voices, but in Africa, home to 30% of the world's biodiversity, African conservationists blaze a new path forward. On Africa Forward, a podcast supported by African Wildlife Foundation and produced by FP Studios, hear about green infrastructure, Africa's tremendous biodiversity, and how African-led conservation may save endangered species and the planet. Listen to season two of Africa Forward wherever you get your podcasts. Ruben Vardanyan, it's uh, it's very good to see you again, sir. Same, Jan. Very nice to see you. I, I mean, you know, tr truth and advertising here. You and I have known each other for probably thirty years uh, in, in very different circumstances. Uh, you just became uh, literally a month ago. You became state minister. In other words, you're in charge of this small Armenian enclave that we've known for a long time as Nagorno-Karabakh, that the Armenians refer to as Atsakh. I guess I want to say congratulations, but uh, it, it's not clear that's the right sentiment. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and it's very, uh, I did expect, which I didn't expect it myself, but I thought it's very important for my nation, for this enclave people who was living there. So, I mean, the, the big news and the reason why you and I are talking today is not because you've just taken this position, but rather because uh, your your region uh, has one way out, basically, uh, to get to Armenia. Um, and it's just been cut off uh, that that corridor, that transit corridor has just been cut off by Azeri protesters for three days now. Um, and that feels like a humanitarian crisis. What what happened? You're right. Um, this was the main reason why I moved from Moscow to Stepanakert, the capital of uh, Artsakh, uh, because I felt something going wrong, and I want to stay with the people who've been living in this region 30 years and saying, I'm with you. I'm 
ready to share all the difficulties which you are facing. And it was the challenge started not now, the challenge started before. And a um, week ago, the Azerbaijan decided to block the, the road, which only one we had to Armenia. And they put ecological requirements saying we have an ecology problem, which is where again we found strange because we said we are happy to accept any international best specialist to come and check any ecological issue which you can maybe trying to find in our mining uh, business which we have in, our, in Arza. But they put uh, conditions and they put requirements which was unacceptable from point of they didn't want to anyone to come accept them. We said, but this is not real. He said, we, need, we need to see the real ecological people, not the fake what you are putting in a, a street and showing us like the ecological specialist. They put so many requirements in uh, not only ecology, but in other areas about the mining business. And we don't want to talk with us at the same time. And says, so this is unacceptable. If you want to talk with the other part, you need to sit to the table and discuss this all by face to face with maybe international representatives will be, will be part of this negotiation uh, process, but you cannot avoid the government of Arza, you cannot avoid the state which was established and operating 30 years already. Your, your territory is not formally recognized as independent uh, by the government of Azerbaijan. It's true, it's true, but at the same time, uh, we all know the story about Arza. It was become independent before Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, people who was living in nagorno karabakh Kaftanom Oblast made the vote in, in referendum and become uh, free from Azerbaijan uh, Soviet Republic in the 1990s. Why, again, it was all happened so many years ago and people was living here with the own constitution, with the parliament, with the, the only government of institutions operating like independent state. This is why, and by much more democratic, by the way, people saying, why are you not accepting to be living with Azerbaijan? People are saying, to be honest, I'm, I, I feel uh, bad for the Azerb Azeri people, not Armenian people. We have a country where there's uh, no democracy, and people, the president and, and his wife is a vice, vice president, and he don't have any human rights, uh, 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 really human rights for people who've been living in uh, Azerbaijan, being Azeris, not for Armenian, Armenians. So I, for us, we know it's strange to have this discussion because our Azerbaijan is a, representing much more democratic much real democratic country with a real democratic institution which operating in a, uh, this uh, place 30 years. So, but as of right now, there is no transit. There is no way to get um, out of... No. Uh, is that correct? No, we had a hundred twenty around 120,000 people. There are 30,000 kids who unfortunately cannot go to school because we don't have not only roads, but also they cut off get gas also. And they basically creating full blockade, except the electricity, which we actually day by day, but we can cut. We cannot move the um, people who need to be medical services because not everything you can do in Artsakh. And we have a couple of patients who are really in a bad stage and we couldn't do anything to move them uh, out of the Artsakh. We don't have, we don't get any food, we don't get any uh, medicaments, we don't get anything. That's why. It's full blockade. It's like I said, like Western Berlin. I, I, for me, it looks like the Western Berlin. The only thing which we believe it can be done to change the situation is creating like Western Berlin, an air, the, air, air, air bridge. Yeah. Yes, I, knew, air bridge. I knew that's what you're going to say. Uh, and are there, but are there planes that are flying in and out from Yerevan to Southern No, America? no, no, never. It's we had the airport which was fully equipped in the, and, 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 and reconstructed and can operate uh, for quite big uh, airplanes. Uh, for Boeing 737 or Airbus 319, but at the same time, it's never been, because Azerbaijan never allowed to fly. But I think now with humanitarian catastrophe, it's the only way we can really get anything from outside. It's uh, getting the airplanes who can deliver us all what we needed. Now, there's been a lot of military fighting uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, shelling, soldiers have been killed. Uh, the Azeri uh, military today is considerably stronger than the Armenian military, and of course, uh, that meant that a lot of territory uh, that the Azeris had occupied, that the Armenians had occupied, had been retaken by Azerbaijan. Um, do, do you are there indications that this is going to relapse into a broader war between the two countries? I hope not, but I just want to remind that the war was started in 1990 from Azerbaijan. They tried to make the ethnic cleaning to Artsakh and Nagorno-Karabakh people, 
and they in those winner we've been using we've been winner in the first two years but they lost everything in two in 1992-1994 which is why it was territory was occupied after they, they tried to basically clean up all the Armenians been living in Shaman region get Ashen region not only Karabakh it was many places where the Armenian was uh, living in a concentrated in big, big uh, communities and they clean up with all other places except the Karabakh and um, I hope it will not happen again and again because we need to stop this uh, type of approach. One one day, your winner, second day, where, they are winner. We need to find a way how, with all the difficulties, with all the hateness that we have, we need to find a way to live together like neighbors, not together from country, but neighbors who need to accept each other and not hate each other and not kill each other. That's why my our message was all me. We will not live together like one state, but we can live in one region because we've been living close to each other by hundreds of years but in the same time we cannot live in one state because we have a different culture different attitude to democracy different approach to the uh, many other things and uh, we don't see ourselves be part of the country which have an absolutely different uh, system of the of uh, management of their own people now you look your point that when the armenians were stronger in a stronger position they didn't want to negotiate even though people were telling them to now the azeris are in a stronger position they don't want to negotiate uh, and of course uh, the people in the in between are the ones that suffer and we're seeing that right now now um you know one of the other major challenges you have of course is the fact that armenia's principal friend is russia um, and they're not doing so well right now, and they're a little bit distracted, right? And certainly their relations with the West are completely broken for reasons that are thoroughly understandable. Um, wh what happens in the situation where the protector of Armenia and of your own um, autonomous region um, is is suddenly, uh, you know, sort of out to lunch? I mean, I assume you've been talking with them over the last few days, but what's the nature of your relationship with the Russian government right now? You know, we have a Russian peacemaker who've been uh, peace uh, soldiers who've been uh, uh, staying with us the last two years after the uh, 44 days war. The problem what we face with them is that we have a very limited number. It's only less than 2,000 of them. Uh, and we have a very uh, clear mandate and uh, light weapon. And this is why for us, uh, one of the people points we'd be putting uh, in a negotiation with the Russians and with the others saying we need to have a much longer uh, in terms of the peacemakers staying with us in here in the region. Second, we want to get international uh, organization recognizing this mandate. And by the way, it's surprisingly, it's, uh, I think it's only one conflict with the France and the United States. There was no big difference between Russia and they accepting that Russia, U.S. and France can work together in this dispute. This, this is why it's a quite unusual situation with the current uh, reality that we are facing in other places where West and Russia don't have they don't have don't have a different views about the, what Artsakh needs to stay uh, independent from Azerbaijan. You, you know, the France recently the Senate of the France recognized the the rights of Armenians living in Artsakh to have their own uh, state, and they've been supporting uh, strongly this uh, uh, situation of uh, Armenians trying to keep their own independence. What are Azerbaijan's demands as of right now? Basically, they said it's uh, our territory. We want to do whatever we want to do it, and we don't care about uh, any your institutional status. We are treating you like the, the people who is living in our territory, like our citizens. At the same time, you know, it's a uh, really strange what they're doing because if they're treating us like a their citizen, they're not allowing people who've been doing farming, for example, to do their work, and shooting people who just doing their farming work, or they've been cutting now there's electricity, they're cutting the gas and the roads for people who being you know, they will allow them to get normal life. That's why it's a strange that you want to attract people to stay in your country at the same time creating so much uh, terrible pressure. But Azerbaijan basically, uh, in one hand saying you are, you can live a normal life in our country and just being one of the uh, ethnic minorities and at the same time doing everything with everybody will live from here and uh, they want to clean up it made the ethnic in the place with Armenian world was one of the most important part of Armenian world because, for example, our founder of the our alphabet, Mestro Mashtot, his first monastery where he started his first school in the fifth century, he was in, in Artsakh, in Garabakh. And this is why it's not only a place for people who are living there, but it's a place for the entire Armenian nation 
living in different part of the world because it's a symbol of Armenia, one of the key Armenian places for yeah, Armenian. For, for people that don't know, I mean, when back when Stalin was the commissar of nationalities, this is well before he took over the Soviet Union, he created right all of these uh, basically nested territories um, that made it, uh, you know, made it very difficult to ever imagine the Soviet Union would fall apart because it would create all of this conflict. Um, and you see that in Central Asia, you see it in the Caucasus, you see it in the Middle Volga, you see it everywhere. So it's uh, unfortunately these traps that have been laid for generations now are, are becoming real violent wars uh, between very different nations that are living next to and amidst each other. And I've seen the Europeans have condemned the blockade uh, and, and they've called on the Azeris to end it as soon as possible. Have the Americans made a statement yet? Yes, also the State Department made a statement also saying we are very worried about the situation. We uh, would request for Azari to open the road. Uh, otherwise, it's a big danger for not only by between Artsakh and Azari, but also Azerbaijan, but also Armenia, Azerbaijan peace agreement will be under big danger, as they said in their statement. And what about Turkey? Uh, of course, NATO ally, uh, but also the most important ally of Azerbaijan, just how complicated this gets, of course. Um, has Erdogan uh, made any statement? Has he responded to uh, what uh, President Aliyev and others have been doing? No, but uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, just recently made the statement. They fully support uh, requirements from Azerbaijan to have a ecological uh, right for ecological uh, monitoring of the situation in the mining businesses which belong to Azerbaijan uh, nation and Azerbaijan state. So I may support it uh, from level of Minister of Foreign Affairs. Not so ta tacitly government. supporting the blockade as it stands right now. Yes, yeah, yeah, we are supporting fully, yeah. But so what's your, what's your best hope for how this gets resolved quickly? What needs to happen? <laughs> you know, people who have not been here, we don't understand Artsakh, uh, it's quite a unique place. If not only historically is Armenian motherland of the many of generations of people who've been living here, but also people who've been very, very strong, very strong by the character. We got two marshals of Soviet Union, Bagramyan and Babajanyan. We got 28 generals. People here is ready to fight, ready for support beyond um, the Destiny and their own uh, motherland, and they are ready to fight for their own values. And this is why I think the Artsakh people are ready for staying as long as necessary to get the right to say, You must understand, we can talk when you will recognize us like independent state who can operate in the some level of the autonomy from everyone with understanding we are small, we cannot be fully independent in the world, whereas everybody is depending from each other. But we can be the only neighbors. We cannot be together. And this is, I think, the Artsakh people basically said, this is a, light, it's a red light for us. We are not doing anything else. If you are not accepting us like uh, part of the uh, your neighbor uh, reality, it's really not an option. This is why I think it's a situation which is bringing all of us in, the, in reality. And we all need to accept this is the way what we can only live if we can live like neighbors, but not nothing else. Well, you know, Ruben, my friend, uh, of all of my friends that have left Moscow, they all left for places that were less isolated than Russia. You're the only person I know that left for a place that's more isolated than Russia, which is completely crazy. But I hope, I really hope that we can end this soon and get back to uh, something approaching normalcy. Uh, it's really good to see you. Thank you, Yan. That's it for today's edition of the G Zero World Podcast. Like what you've heard? Come check us out at g0media.com and sign up for our newsletter, Signal. The G Zero World podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. As the world industrialized, nature suffered. Conservation has been dominated by Western voices, but in Africa, home to 30% of the world's biodiversity, African conservationists blaze a new path forward. On Africa Forward, a podcast supported by African Wildlife Foundation and produced by FP Studios, 
Hear about green infrastructure, Africa's tremendous biodiversity, and how African-led conservation may save endangered species and the planet. Listen to season two of Africa Forward wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to the G-Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G-Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G-Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.